If you are new around here, I'm no stranger to covering the Bridgerton franchise. When the first season dropped, I gobbled it right up, read the entire book series, and made a video about all of the above. Then, out of frustration with certain responses to the second season, I made a slightly unhinged video about that too. Originally, I thought I might make a joint review of Queen Charlotte and season three whenever that came out, but evidently I've changed my mind. It turns out Bridgerton opinion having is an unending task. As long as this title continues to be expanded upon, I'll show up to talk about it. It's like my bat signal. Anyway, feel free to check out either of those previous videos for more context about the Bridgerton world or my thoughts on it, but we're gathered here today to discuss the spin-off and its companion novel, which I did read. On that note, perhaps the first thing I'll say is that once you've read or watched Queen Charlotte, there's not much to be gained from engaging with it in the other medium. I mean, aside from the unique virtues inherent to text and film, like the show offers performances and visuals where the book allows you inside of the characters' heads, but by and large we are looking at identical stories here, which is fair enough. I suppose when it was announced, that Shonda Rhimes and Julia Quinn would work in tandem on their versions, I should have presumed as much. I'm not sure what I expected, but I'm reminded of finding out that Nicholas Sparks wrote the last song as a screenplay before a novel. It's an order of operations that disrupts my practice method of analyzing adaptation. There's not exactly an original in this scenario to weigh the value of changes made to. It's just one story, told twice, with a few structural differences. The biggest difference is undoubtedly that the novel doesn't feature a quote-unquote present timeline. It's bookended by flash forwards but beyond them strictly set in the Georgian era. This means that it doesn't depict Charlotte's campaign for the repopulation of the royal bloodline nor the shenanigans of Violet Bridgerton and Lady Danbury's gardening club. Violet isn't in it at all actually, neither is her father. That being the case, young Agatha never discovers Lord Ledger to be of beekeeping age. Putting it that way, maybe I've undersold how much content is exclusive to the show, but not necessarily the other way around. I think what I anticipated in reading the story after watching it was to trade in the storylines of supporting characters all together for additional content between George and Charlotte. Something you'll know if you've seen either of my prior Bridgerton videos is that I find the series as written by Julia Quinn to lack in subplots. If the differences between this spin-off and its novelization mirrored the differences between the first season and its source material, I think Queen Charlotte the book would alternate back and forth between the perspectives of its leads alone. Instead, like the show, it also treats us to the perspectives of Brimsley, a character I never guessed I'd be as invested in as I am, and known star of this entire IP, Agatha Danbury. It's true that A, B, and C plots are integral to television in a way they aren't to romance novels, but I for one like to see them. So ultimately I don't mean to criticize the book for sharing a lot with the series because it's by virtue of inheriting the show's design that this Bridgerton novel has skyrocketed to the top of my rankings. I mean, I still have a soft spot for It's In His Kiss, but even that one shares most of the recurring issues I've taken with Julia Quinn's work, issues which Queen Charlotte sidestepped for the most part. I'll have you know that my least favorite scene in the book is one of very few prominent scenes without dialogue directly lifted from the script. It's glossed over in the show exactly how they came to such an agreement, but George and Charlotte spend episode three repeatedly consummating their marriage on even-numbered days, feigning reluctance to do so. It is an even day, obviously. Well, we do not need to adhere to every even day. We do not. <clears throat> We did agree to even days. Now, feigned reluctance, as I'm calling it, is an exceedingly common romantic trope, but a sticky one. A writer could easily cross the line into non-consensual territory while aiming for it, and they often do. I don't think this miniseries did, though. I think they pulled off an air of reluctance mainly by making it mutual. In other words, neither party is the aggressor. They share an attitude about the whole thing, and it makes for a delightful sequence, if you ask me. It is a nightmare. I am so sorry. I hate everything about him. Julia Quinn, on the other hand, included the conversation where in the leads strike this deal. In it, George does come off as more of an aggressor to me. More of a seducer, at least. He's not reluctant, only she is, and suddenly you're rereading every sex scene this author has ever written, complete with subtle male dominance and coercion. I clarify subtle to make clear that it's not technically an abusive exchange by any means. In fact, I think Julia Quinn was considerably more careful with her words than she once would have been. Charlotte plays at refusing her husband and pretends not to want him, but she always verbally changes her mind or admits the opposite. When she asks if he'd force her, he might not say no, but he does say it would not come. 
come to that. Woke king alert. No, he wouldn't force her and he narrates as much. I don't think this scene depicts marital rape, nor do I think it crosses the line into non-consensual territory. I just think it inches closer to that line than the show cared to. I think it flirts with the line. In truth, I find it less offensive and more tired. George and Charlotte revert into a stock hero and heroine. I recall wondering aloud in my first video whether the problems I had with the original series were unique to it or reflective of a most erotic historical romance. Some of my biggest problems were with the routine appearance of dubious consent and the tendency of every male lead towards misogyny. Well, I still haven't read any other so-called bodice rippers, but I have done more research about that label and a lot of outlets include violence against women in its definition. Of course, the Duke and I favored violence against men, but my point in bringing this up is to say that I now recognize the subjugation of women as part of the appeal for frequenters of this subgenre, most of whom are women themselves. It was a realization I came to last year that the patriarchal elements of Bridgerton were never an accident. They were something readers showed up for. And because I would never presume anybody's preferences in fiction inherently reflective of their ideologies in the real world, I won't judge them for that. I will point out, however, that the overwhelming success of Shondaland's adaptation has brought with it new eyes with different sensibilities. Speaking for myself, when I'm expected to root for a fictional pairing, I usually want to be unequivocally convinced that their relationship is healthy, even if it must suffer complications for conflict's sake. That's one reason why I found Queen Charlotte so refreshing as a Bridgerton novel. The scene in question sticks out like a sore thumb, but all in all, I'm able to enjoy Julia Quinn's writing style more when it's mostly absent the problematic trappings of bodice ripping. I've at the very least been convinced that she's a skilled adapter. In a lot of ways, the pacing of the book makes better sense. The story's events take place linearly, different characters narrate each chapter and their points of view are interwoven. Conversely, the six episode limited series holds out on its male lead's perspective until episode four, which essentially just retraces his steps throughout the first three. It's framed as something of a reveal because attentive viewers definitely have questions about what he's been up to, but attentive viewers who know King George III suffered a mental illness of some kind have also probably already guessed along the right lines, meaning it feels a bit strenuous to move backward instead of forward with only two episodes on the clock. Don't mistake me for saying that his scenes weren't worthwhile though. I simply think they could have been edited throughout. Anyway, I'm not totally done comparing aspects of these two interpretations, but I'd like to delve deeper now into the individual storylines of every major character. And if we were going in order from who I had the least to most commentary about, we'd start with Violet. No offense to the former Viscountess, I'd love for her and Edmund to lead another spin-off, but her relevance to this one is questionable. I can't say I disliked seeing glimpses of her younger self, nor seeing her bond with Lady D, but it's telling how little was lost without her in the novel. Still, I'm curious as to why she was left out of it. Could be just because she served mainly to fill out the short show and the book didn't require that padding, but I wonder if Julia Quinn also wasn't keen on canonizing her father's affair in the original continuity. Then again, the question of whether or not Queen Charlotte is canon to the previous Bridgerton novels is a complicated one to answer. This won't be news to many of you, but the Queen isn't actually a character in them. She's an off-page figure of the historical setting, but decidedly not a character. Theoretically, a little side story about her wouldn't stand to contradict anything, but this one does primarily because of the racial relations it depicts. Quick recap. Before now, everyone in the books was presumably white. Race bending is to thank for the diversity of their on-screen counterparts, but Bridgerton's unique approach to colorblind casting has been subject to a lot of criticism. This mostly because a single scene in season one clarified that its fantastical take on the Regency era wasn't absent of racism, rather racism had recently been solved by love. We were two separate societies divided by color until a king fell in love with one of us. Love, your grace, conquers all. In my opinion, they've attempted to walk that sentiment back with the spinoff. It's still canon divergent historical fan fiction, but the question isn't what if George and Charlotte's love solved racism, it's what if their union 
was a political move toward integration. I doubt anybody considers this development a cure-all, but it's an undeniable improvement. Perhaps not a bitingly realistic portrayal of desegregation, but that's not what this universe was built for anyway. Personally, I think they explored some thought-provoking ideas, namely through Agatha's character. I'm fascinated by her positioning as sort of an invisible force for good, who's ultimately responsible for a lot of progress that she'll likely never be recognized for. In one of my favorite lines from the novel, she notes that she's about to cement her place in history and no one will ever know it. But here's my thing. If the Great Experiment, as it's referred to, now exists in the books, what does that mean canonically? If Lady Danbury is dark-skinned in Queen Charlotte, is she dark-skinned in Romancing Mr. Bridgerton? Better yet, is she dark-skinned in It's In His Kiss? Hyacinth's love interest is her grandson. Is Gareth black too? The Duke of Hastings also makes an appearance in Queen Charlotte as another recently titled person of color, so Simon's complexion is up for debate as well. Mind you, I do not ask these questions because I'm bothered by the prospect of somebody imagining these characters as non-white. My worry is that inclusivity is being retroactively accredited to a series where it's absent by an author who's on multiple occasions eaten her feet trying to explain why. This concern of mine might pair well with an ongoing discussion about the show's tie-in covers. It's standard practice for cast members of an adaptation to appear on special editions of the source material, but in Bridgerton's case this has led to people picking up The Duke and Die or The Viscount Who Loved Me, expecting an interracial romance only to be met with Simon's icy blue eyes or Kate's pale skin. At the end of the day, I don't foresee Julia Quinn pulling a JKR and pretending her characters were racially ambiguous all along. If you asked them, I think her and Shonda Rhimes would say that Queen Charlotte's companion novel technically introduces a third canon to the franchise. I'm just wary of a margin for argument, but I'd be interested in other perspectives on this. To get back on track, because we already touched on her, let's talk Agatha, who I pretty much watched the spinoff for. Realistically, I was going to tune in regardless, but to be honest, Charlotte was never my favorite character in the mainline series. I was open to learning more about her, and I have, but initially it was harder for me to muster up excitement to see her backstory than Lady Danbury's. Lady D has always been ripe for a prequel. Up until now, her history was rather mysterious. She was a widow, but not in the same way as Violet. You know, there's not a tragic sense that she'd lost the love of her life. Her singledom came off as something more empowering, and I did enjoy witnessing the character's journey to that place. It must be said, however, that part of said journey is suffering, and I've seen some discourse about the uncomfortable beginnings of her storyline. Basically, over the course of Queen Charlotte, we witness the death of her much older husband, her affair with the much older Lord Ledger, and her eventual rejection of the Queen's brother. In the end, it's an arc all about romantic and sexual liberation, but before Lord Danbury finally croaks, there are numerous scenes which see him assault Agatha, at least by our modern standards. I wouldn't say she herself views it that way, or that it was intentionally framed that way, but she's clearly unenthusiastic about her marital obligations, even if obligations are all she considers them. Apparently the script went as far as to specify that these encounters weren't sexual assaults, and I guess I'm of the differing opinion that we should call it what it is, regardless of what they would have called it at the time. I know some people don't think S.A. ever has a place in fiction, and while I'm sympathetic to that perspective, I tend to think execution matters a lot. The way I see it, this is simply an example of poor execution. The scenes weren't particularly graphic, violent, or frequent, which I can respect, but they were borderline comedic, which is where they lost me. The worst part is that they were entirely unnecessary, and I don't mean in a broader sense. I mean that you could literally edit them out, and with no other changes, their events would still track. It's set up that Agatha's maid, Coral, routinely draws her baths afterwards, and wouldn't it have been more creative to let those scenes spell it out anyway? I have your bath waiting, Mum. You gave me no warning. I had no warning. We always have a warning. Not this time. Coral. I've had the upstairs footman bring up water for a bath. Coral, you need not draw baths as often. Nonsense, my lady. You need not draw baths as often. We are... We are done. <laughs> we are done. Suffice to say, 
I'm in agreement with those who wish the actual intimate scenes between Lord and Lady Danbury were left out, but I'm honestly in disagreement with those who wish the entire plot point was left out, and I have seen that argued. In a lot of ways, it makes perfect sense. For one thing, there's a layer added by her blackness that I can't speak to, and for another, it doesn't escape me that I've yet to get through a Bridgerton video without including content warnings. I don't love that, but I do find Agatha's arc meaningful overall. To me, there's value in watching her grapple with independence for the first time. There's value in watching her learn that sex isn't supposed to be tedious. Speaking of, for that reason, I missed her affair in the book. I don't necessarily ship this pairing or get why it had to be Violet's dad instead of someone her own age, but I do prefer knowing she eventually experienced desire. Might I remind you, Lady Danbury's version of the birds and the bees is what had Charlotte under the impression that having her head hit the wall over and over again was inevitable. I do not like the part where my head hits the wall over and over again. Is there a way to avoid that? There's comfort in the idea that Agatha's older self has known a gentler form of intimacy. Plus, in the season two, she told Kate she'd loved and lost, so if she wasn't referring to her husband, she had to be referring to somebody. I have lived a life. I am a widow. I have loved. I have lost. All things considered, despite her storyline's rocky start, I appreciated Lady Danbury's progression throughout the miniseries. To the contrary, while I enjoyed the beginning of Brimsley's romance with Reynolds, I found the ambiguous ending of their story disappointing, and not just because it's a bummer. Actually, I'll have to reiterate this in a moment when I move on to the leads, but I think a major strength of Queen Charlotte compared to Bridgerton proper is its ability to stray from clear-cut happy endings. The sequence of present Brimsley dancing alone, knowing he once considered it possible to grow old with Reynolds, is affecting, and I love it for that. My issue, I suppose, is that it's a woefully incomplete plot line, and there's no way of knowing what went wrong. To be fair, I doubt this is the last we'll see or hear from them, but whether Reynolds is introduced to the Regency era or featured in another prequel of some kind, you can mark me down as unsatisfied for now. There's also a Reynolds scene in the novel that I wish was in the show. Nothing major, just a little backstory about his childhood friendship with George, which enriches their relationship, I think. It seems like the book is more of an adaptation of the script than the other way around, but why not include a little something like that? Anyway, it's high time we dive in to discussing the leads. And to start, allow me to explain why I said Queen Charlotte was never my favorite character in the mainline series. In short, it's because I've always felt like she was written to be more of a plot device than character. Think about it. Functionally, she serves to apply pressure throughout most of either season. If she doesn't care as much to ensure the successes of her chosen diamonds, if she doesn't set up Daphne and the Prince, if she doesn't host Antony and Edwina's wedding, the stakes drop dramatically. Yet, when it's most convenient, when it's time for the leads to wind up together, she'll relent if convinced they're truly in love. Her characterization has been consistent in that way, at least. She's a romantic at heart, but do you get what I mean? Only a few scenes in seasons one and two really put me in her shoes over someone else's. Notably, there are those that deal with her marriage to George, so maybe I should have been more excited to see their story play out than I was. I intend to title this video Queen Charlotte Ruined My Life, and now that I think about it, I've yet to unequivocally state that I enjoyed the spin-off, so to be clear, that's a compliment. It ruined my life in the best way. If I'm being stalked through my laptop's webcam, I've likely been caught tearing up to Farmer George edits a lot since it dropped. The chemistry between India and Corey is just delectable, the dialogue of their big romantic moments is perfectly over the top, and it all culminates in a bittersweet ending which unlocks emotions only bittersweet endings can. And I don't want to discredit uncomplicated happily ever afters. I think there's a reason they're expected of the romance genre, and they're often exactly what I'm looking for. But in real life as well as online, the prevailing compliment I've heard about Queen Charlotte is that it's deeper, darker, or heavier than Bridgerton. Make no mistake, it's still the trashy borderline pornography we know and love, but it's not beholden to a saccharine epilogue. It allows you not to believe that everything will be fine as long as they're together, allows you to empathize with the toll 
George's worsening condition has taken on both of them. I can rack my brain for criticisms. Like I said, I think the pacing is kind of weird, and while it's pretty easy to write this off as a consequence of the time jump, past and present Charlotte aren't always congruent characters to me. They seem pretty different, but overall, this is probably my favorite season of Bridgerton thus far. I think that's true for a lot of fans, and thinking back to the lukewarm response the announcement of this spinoff got, we owe Shonda Rhimes an apology. I get why this was her pet project. I think it was worth telling this story, even if it's like strikingly short for a show. I liked it. Before we part ways, I'm sorry I didn't have a spreadsheet this time. I, I couldn't think of one. I couldn't think of one. But maybe that can be just part of my uh, reviews of the, the mainline seasons. I also, I also didn't get the teacups out. Sorry. <laughs>